Okay. We've let another minute go so that now we have, um, I see 47 participants. So again, um, good day, good evening to all of you. Thank you for joining us in this webinar on strengthening regulatory frameworks for water and sanitation resilience. Uh, my name is Robert Boss. I'm senior advisor to the International Water Association. And this webinar is a joint effort by the International Water Association and the European Union which is having its Green Week this week with many events, and this is one of them. We will be, for the next one and a half hour, um, addressing the issues of regulation um, of water and sanitation services and how resilience can be supported by it and how resilience can be introduced into these regulatory frameworks. As you know, IWA is the International Water Association. It's um, an international global um, in organization of practitioners and professionals working in water and sanitation. Um, and it organizes many events like this. And of course, it has its flagship events, the big congresses. The next one will be in, in Toronto, in Canada, 11 to 15 August. Now, webinar information, um, as you've already seen, this webinar is being recorded and it will be made available on demand through the IWA Connect Plus platform on the IWA website. Um, and of course, the slides sets will also be made available to you. The speakers um, for, of today, who I will introduce um, in a few minutes, are responsible for securing copyright permissions for what they present in their slides. Um, and I should also have the um, standard disclaimer that any opinions, views, conclusions, recommendations that are contained in these presentations um, are uh, the responsibility only of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect, reflect the IWA policy or views or opinions. So on the next slide, um, some uh, housekeeping. Um, you know, we will be... Um, uh, making available both the chat box and the um, Q&A box, which are at the bottom of your screen. And um, you can uh, do some general chatting and requests um, in the chat box. Uh, the Q&A box is reserved for sending your questions to the panelists when we come to the panel discussions. Um, and they will be monitored by the panelists, but also especially by Isabella Espindola, who is in the IWA Secretariat and responsible for a number of issues, including organizing this webinar in IWA. Um, and she will be uh, screening the Q&A box to see what questions are coming in. So on the next slide um, there, you'll see um, uh, the objectives of this webinar as agreed. Uh, first of all, we want to look at adaptive regulatory strategies. In other words, how can regulatory frameworks adapt to the dynamic challenges of water management in pursuit of greater resilience? Technology integration. So the question there is how can technological advances enhance regulatory processes aimed at greater water resilience? And then the issue of cross-sectoral collaboration. Um, how can institutional arrangements and cross-sectoral collaboration among regulators, utilities, and communities contribute to achieve resilience goals? That's um, a topic that is particularly close to my heart because I worked for many years on that in the World Health Organization to get um, environment, health, and water people to work more closely together across the sectoral boundaries and outside of their silos. So on the next um, page, on the next slide, um, maybe some issues related to what we're thinking about when we discuss uh, resilience, because it's the key word of this webinar. Um, but what does it really mean for the water and sanitation sector? So one definition I found on the next slide is uh, the one offered by the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. Um, which, of course, is the uh, UN agency that deals with the prevention and control of disasters um, and which has been behind the uh, agreement known as the Sendai uh, uh, Agreement of 2015. 
Uh, and they say that resilience is the ability of a system, community, or society exposed to hazards to resist, absorb, accommodate, adapt to, and transform and recover from the effects of a hazard in a timely and efficient manner, including through the preservation and reservation of its essential basic structures and functions through risk management. So the operational part of that definition is risk management, um, which helps you to do all those things to um, be able to resist the impact of hazards. The other uh, one that I found is uh, also resilience is from the group that deals with the um, planetary health. Um, that's um, that's Johan Rockström and uh, the late Malin Falkenmark and, and their colleague Van Erlandsson. Um, and they say that it, resilience is the capacity of socio-ecological systems to deal with shocks, adapting to changing conditions and transforming in situations of crisis which are fundamentally dependent on the functions of water, that is to regulate the Earth's climate, to support biomass production, and to supply water resources to human societies. So here you have just two thoughts on the you know, quite complex idea of resilience. Um, and so on the next slide, we'll look at the agenda that we're going to be dealing with this next period. Um, First of all, some relevant materials as a reference so that you can uh, find those when you revisit this, this um, recording and you, you get this page and you can see um, what other reading materials are available on the subject of regulation, resilience, and also the human rights to safe drinking water and sanitation, which is closely related to these issues. Um, but the agenda then, no, where do I keep thinking I'm getting the agenda next at the end. The speakers. Today we have um, three speakers um, who will address these questions that come up in the objective. Yeah. One is uh, Batsi Majuro from the WHO, um, and I will introduce them in greater detail when it's their turn. The second is Vera Aero from Ersa in Portugal, and the third is Yvonne Magawa from SOAS in Zambia. Um, and so I think... Um, with that, we then come to the agenda. Um, so you see, we talk first about strengthening cross-sectoral collaboration for water resilience, the wider perspective by Batsi. Then two case studies, one from ESAWAS, that's Yvonne Magawa from Zambia, and then ERSAR, the Portuguese regulator by Vera Ero. And after that, we go into our panel discussion. For all of you, when you have immediate questions of um, uh, clarification after one of the presentations, please raise those in the question and answer, um, and we'll address them immediately so that you don't have to remember them till the end of the three discussion, three presentations. Um, but otherwise, any more, you know, conceptual in-depth questions, please leave those for the discussion afterwards. Um, so that having been said, I propose we now move to the first presentation, which is by um, Batsi Majuro. She's a technical officer in the Water Sanitation, Health, Hygiene and Health Unit at WHO in Geneva, focusing on regulation in her work, uh, where she coordinates the WHO International Network of Drinking Water and Sanitation Regulators, also known as REGNET. Um, and in this role, Betsy works with regulators, policymakers, and various international partners on water and sanitation regulation. Her academic background is in environmental health, and she holds a PhD in public health and water policy from the University of East Anglia. So, Betsy, the floor is yours. Thank you, Robert, and a very good day to everybody who is joining us today, and thank you um, for joining us for this session. So as Robert has already mentioned, I will be speaking uh, more to the third objective that was, li that was listed um, for this webinar. And this is really to do with strengthening cross-sectoral collaboration. But I really want to take it from a slightly broader perspective, thinking about what is happening in the water and sanitation sector um, as a whole and what that might mean for regulation. Next slide, please. So I'm going to start off with just um, something related to what Robert just mentioned, because in his introduction, he just gave um, a couple of definitions that we could be thinking about when we talk about resilience. But um, that's one of the things that I also want to touch on, um, the need for a common understanding of um, resilience or 
um, more specifically what I'll be talking about, climate resilience. What are we talking about exactly and what does that look like? What would a monitoring framework that is harmonized um, for climate resilience look like? And then I'll talk a bit about some of the current efforts um, that are ongoing to address this question, some of the challenges and um, what the role and input of regulators would look like. Next slide, please. So whenever we talk about resilience, um, I guess the first question that comes to my mind is, do we have a sound agreed upon normative definition and some monitoring framework with core indicators that we put in all reference um, when we talk about resilience? Um, and why this is important is because we also want to think about, okay, are we talking about the same thing when we're talking about resilience and how can we monitor progress and evaluate impact and ensure accountability amongst the entities that are supposed to be implementing whatever it is related to resilience. And I think this is a, a question that is confronting the sector um, quite strongly in recent years because of the different phenomena that are occurring, that are affecting um, the resilience of our water and sanitation systems. Next slide, please. So, why it would be beneficial to have a common understanding and monitoring framework is that it would allow consistent tracking of such resilience in the water, sanitation, and hygiene sector or wash sector, either in a country or over a set of countries across time. Um, but it will also allow for better harmonization amongst collaborators or development partners in countries, or more specifically amongst regulators utilities and the communities that they're working with. If everybody's speaking the same language and understanding how we can all measure things um, in a common way, then we know how we can be tracking our progress. Next slide, please. So there are some current efforts that are ongoing to tackle this question and more specifically around climate resilient wash. And these are efforts that are being led by the Joint Monitoring Program for Water Supply, Sanitation and Hygiene. Um, otherwise known as the WHO UNICEF JMP, which is the platform that is responsible for global monitoring of water and sanitation services um, in the sustainable development, uh, sustainable development agenda, um, as well as the GLASS platform, which is another UN uh, platform, which, and GLASS stands for UN Water Global Analysis and Assessment of Sanitation and Drinking Water. So for those of you who are familiar with these monitoring platforms, JMP monitors more um, the output side of things. What do wash services look like? What is the current level of access to safe drinking water or safe sanitation services? Whereas GLASS looks more at the enabling environment. What are the policies, the regulations or the institutional arrangements that allow for the progression of these wash services? And so these two entities together are uh, looking at developing indicators for global monitoring of climate resilient wash. Um, so there's a current focus on climate resilience, but of course it's also thinking about resilience more broadly. And um, this is a two-year project that these two entities are undertaking where they'll be specifically reviewing existing frameworks, existing tools, and existing indicators with the idea of eventually working towards harmonization um, of those indicators and supporting uptake by countries. So not just coming up with indicators, but really looking at how those indicators can be applied um, at a country level in order to accommodate this um, consistent tracking across various countries. Next slide, please. This effort is also linked to another effort, which some of you might be familiar with if you're tracking what is happening um, on the United Nations climate change discussions. And this is to do with the global goal on adaptation. So these are complementary um, pieces of work with a JMP and GLASS effort meant to link in with this work on the global goal on climate adaptation. But there are a few challenges when we start to talk about resilience. Um, so first, what is the scope of uh, resilience? Um, and where, where do we draw our boundaries? So we want to think about resilience of what exactly? Are we talking about just resilience of water and sanitation infrastructure? Are we talking about technologies? Are we talking about the supporting systems as well? And of course, there's the services, but then there's also the water resources as well. And so that's something that we want to be thinking about. The next question that we want to be asking ourselves is resilience to what? 
Are we talking about resilience primarily to climate change hazards? Or are we talking about resilience from a broader perspective as what happened with COVID, um, which did have impact um, on water sanitation services in some places um, and would also be something that we need to think about when we frame um, the work around resilience. And the third question, um, I think a very important question is resilience, just so that we can have a functioning um, water sanitation service, or are we talking about resilience more broadly from the perspective of societal resilience, recognizing that water sanitation services also have um, an impact on socioeconomic um, standards and how people are living um, in various socioeconomic con contexts. And then of course, um, any of this work, any tools, any indicators that would come up with would need to be measurable and they would need to be comparable um, across countries and over time. And so these are some of the things that this current work is grappling with. And so um, to support this work, um, JMP and GLASS have engaged a consortium of academic partners um, listed on the screen. Um, so this includes universities, mainly in the United Kingdom, but also in Australia, as well as a water expert working group um, to be feeding into this process and really producing the, um, coming up with, with the knowledge base on what we know currently, what tools they are, what frameworks there are, what indicators there are, um, and how that can be shaped into something that is more harmonized. So there will be various evidence reviews as listed on the screen, but I really just want to highlight that this is not just about looking for resilience in piped water supply systems or in sewer systems, but it's also giving specific thought to what happens in non-piped systems or non-sewer systems, because as we know, the vast majority of the global population does not have access to sewer systems and does not have access to, to um, piped water supplies. And we also need to be thinking about resilience in those settings as well. Um, so the work will be in two phases. Phase one is already ongoing um, and it's really focused on this evidence and review. And then phase two will be more focused on um, measurability of those indicators and how fit they might be um, for the task. And there will be public consultations, um, so opportunities to discuss, you know, which indicators are priority, which ones make sense. Um, and of course, there'll be a final report that will be produced from this. Next slide, please. Um, there are also other complementary efforts that are ongoing. Um, I won't talk through them all, except to highlight the second main bullet. Um, and this is to do with the work that sanitation and water for all um, are doing. They're the climate task team that is working towards a common definition of climate resilient rush services. Because the work that I've been talking about from the JNP and GLASS perspective is really more around the indicators, but um, sanitation and water for are doing a complementary piece of work that would really look at what the normative definition um, of climate resilient rush is. And of course, um, there are lots of other efforts that are um, going on as well, such as the UN expert group on climate change and um, the summit of the future. So we know that there are already examples of um, work that utilities, regulators, governments are doing um, to be addressing climate resilience um, within their wash services. And I've just listed um, just examples of some of the targets, uh, climate sensitive targets that have been set by countries um, within Europe. And this is under the UNECE protocol on water and health, um, given that this is EU Green Week and so you can see examples uh, from Norway on um, some of the targets that they've set for um, water and wastewater plants that are serving more than 50 people, having an, envir an adequate environmental management system that includes um, climate, uh, a risk assessment tool for which climate impacts are considered. Um, and also there are some other examples of Luxembourg um, and from Ukraine, where they've set a target on developing a national strategy for reuse of wastewater in conditions of climate change until 2030 um, with a related regulatory act. But what I do want to highlight, and this is the reason I was, I've been talking about a harmonized approach, is that we have examples of what countries are doing, but um, I would argue that it would be useful to have a common framework from which everybody's working so that we can track over time what countries are doing. 
um, it's nice to see these examples that would also be good to be able to have a common basis for the actions that countries are taking and based on that be able to see what progress is being made. Next slide, please. So based on what, what I've just said, what would be the implications for regulators um, and other implicated stakeholders based on what I've presented just now? I think the first thing is like I've highlighted um, with these reviews that are ongoing by the JNP and GLASS, there are opportunities to engage in this ongoing process uh, to develop uh, definitions and indicators. So if there are tools that you are currently using as utilities, as regulators to address resilience um, or more specifically climate resilience, please share them um, so that they can be included for, for a review. Um, but also participate in the stakeholder consultations that I mentioned, where um, the proposed tools and indicators will also be shared. And we really like to hear your views, particularly as regulators, how feasible are they? Um, what would make sense given various contexts that countries are operating in? And the last point um, is to do with just information sharing um, with other regulators. I think there's a wealth of experience um, that uh, various countries could share, and it would be good to be sharing that in our various fora. Um, there will be the IWA um, regulators forum that will be coming up in August, um, but then there are also other platforms as well, including WHO Regnet, which Robert has already mentioned. So please do share with us what tools, what metrics you're currently using, and what your experience has been in this process. I will stop here for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Betsy, for this um, very comprehensive uh, overview, uh, particularly focusing on the intersectoral linkages and, and also about the, in the international framework of the SDGs in which you're operating. Um, and thank you very much for sticking to time so well. Um, I just have, before we hand over to others, um, I just have one question of clarification and one broader question. The question of clarification is, you talk about these consultations that will take place um, about the development of these um, targets and indicators for resilience in water and sanitation. Um, how can people find out when these consultations are taking place and how can they join them? Thanks. I should have actually included a slide with context. Uh, my apologies for that. But um, I think... Uh, I can share uh, the Regnet platform um, in the chat and people can just contact us through there. And of course, we can link you with the JNP and GRASS teams who will be running these consultations over time. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and the other broader question may be also linked to this SDG framework in which we're all operating, uh, because I, I know that within the SDG framework, there is of course a target that specifically addresses um, resilience, which is 13.1 under the, um, you know, the need to combat climate change, and that is to strengthen the resilience and adaptive capacity to climate-related hazards and natural disasters in all countries. And so uh, my question to you is, is that target um, not enough for the water and sanitation sector to take on board efforts to um, to enhance and strengthen the resilience in member states? Or do you feel that there should be a separate target with indicators, more detailed indicators perhaps, um, for water and sanitation resilience? That's a great question, Robert. I would say that the target is sufficient as it is, but as you all well know, there's a target, um, but the real question is how do you measure progress towards the target? Mm -hmm. And to what extent do um, you know the indicators align with your own sector? And I think this is where um, this JNP and GLASS review is trying to tackle this question because there are lots and lots of different approaches. There are lots and different lots of different tools, which mm -hmm. is actually um, disabling the sector from understanding what is actually going on. And so the target, as it stands, is fine. The real issue is how do we speak the, the same language so that we know how much we're progressing towards the target. Okay, thanks. Uh, Isabella, are there any immediate questions uh, to the presentation by um, Batsi? Robert, uh, we received some questions in the chat. Yeah. Regarding it. Uh, the first one is what strategies could be deployed 
to having an effective and sustainable institutional framework for regulating the sanitation sector, which happens to be the uh, the least paid attention sector. Betsy, you want to respond to that? Um, I, I could say that I can respond to it for now, but I'm sure Yvonne and Vera would also yeah. be very well placed to be responding yeah. or adding to that later. I think um, one of the main issues that we've been trying to address is this issue of um, who has a mandate to do what, which entity is responsible for what. So when we talk about institutional frameworks, we really need to understand what, um, what mandates people have what mechanisms there are for holding people accountable to that mandate. And at FMA, I think you would be aware that there's a tool that we'll be releasing soon um, that seeks to address that question. And this is this roadmap for advancing sanitation regulation, which um, talks extensively about this issue of institutional frameworks and how they can be aligned to actually be able to um, advance sanitation regulation. And of course, there are complementary tools that are out there as well. Yvonne will probably talk about um, a publication that just came out last week on regulating citywide inclusive sanitation. And what is useful about that is it showcases examples of how others have done it. Um, because I think one of the main questions is, you know, what examples can I follow? What has worked in um, setting X compared to my setting? So please look out for those publications. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, Isabella, I think we leave the other question, we park it for later. Um, and of course, if um, Yvonne or Vera want to respond to this first question later on, that's also excellent. So we move on. Thanks again, Betsy. And we move on to uh, the next presentation by Yvonne. Um, Yvonne Magawa is the Executive Secretary of the Eastern and Southern Africa Water and Sanitation Regulators Association, which is maybe i think the newest kit on the block of regional associations for regulation but certainly also the most um, uh, active lately uh, she oversees the support of the um, african water and sanitation regulators to improve urban sanitation services by integrating non sewer sanitation into regulation and since 2023 she is also a member of the advisory board for IWA's Inclusive Urban Sanitation um, Initiative that we just heard mentioning Betsy also. Um, she has over 18 years of experience in water supply and sanitation regulation. She holds a master's in business administration and her responsibilities have mainly focused on formulating and implementing corporate strategy, risk management and corporate branding. Um, and her background in the wash sector includes working in development cooperation and with the Zamb uh, Zambian National Water and Sanitation Regulator. She's been instrumental in supporting the growth of ASOAS, and we've been all been able to witness that. And since its inception and has published since then also several papers on regulation in the region. So Yvonne, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Robert. And thank you to um, the Iowa team for inviting SOS to be part of this webinar for the EU Green Week. So I've already been introduced, so I will just give a brief background of what SOS is. Next slide, please. So SOS is a network of water supply and sanitation regulators um, formed uh, from 2009 from the Eastern and Southern African region. We have two objectives, one which is capacity building and information sharing, and the other one is focused on identifying and encouraging the adoption of best practices to improve effectiveness of uh, water supply and sanitation regulation. So SOS is governed by a constitution and legally registered in Zambia. Uh, we have until November 12 members. Uh, actually, as of last week, we now have 14 members and we are expanding um, to the rest of the continent. Next slide. So coming to today's um, topic uh, with regards to the role of regulatory frame frameworks in water and sanitation resilience, I'll just highlight the work of regulators uh, in trying to foster and promote resilience in the sector and what some of the strategies are for that purpose. 
So one of the first things that uh, regulators are now focusing on is water catchment protection uh, or water source protection or watersheds. So the role of utilities has become important in protecting the watersheds. Trying to uh, put together strategies that protect the water sources that also involve communities in this protection. In Lusaka specifically, they have what is called the Lusaka Water Security Initiative, which is the secretariat is housed within the regulator, but it brings together a number of stakeholders to ensure that there are active strategies being put in place to protect the water sources. So this means fencing them off or ensuring that community practices are not interfering with um, the water recharge zones and so on. So having the regulator involved together with the utility ensures that to some extent, they're able to guarantee um, the quality of the water source and are able to ensure its protection. The other aspect is issues of tariff design. Now within the tariff design, what the regulator does is uh, to promote conservation. The tariff is designed uh, in a way that is a rising block tariff in most cases to ensure that if you're using more water, you have to pay for the, for the extra water. So that tries to promote um, conservation of a very scarce resource, uh, as we are seeing these days. A number of countries this side uh, faced a drought while others are facing flooding. So having a tariff that is designed to take care of water scarcity as well, uh, ensures that in the long term, the utilities can continue to provide services when there is major interruption caused by climate or other effects. Then reducing non-revenue water is, other, is another strategy that uh, regulators are heavily focusing on. Because non-revenue water, when it's the water losses are not very well managed, it forces utilities and the sector to invest in areas of say infrastructure um, uh, uh, investment, where it may not actually be needed. So if we conserve the water, we are able to manage the water losses, it unlocks the revenue that the utilities would need to actually invest in the sector. It could easily increase hours of supply, uh, depending on if these are physical losses, you reduce those physical losses, you have more hours of supply than thinking of maybe we should be building a new treatment plant. So ensuring resilience by managing um, water losses and creating that efficiency for the use of water supplies. Within the Eastern Af and Southern African region, the issue of recycling water is not yet there. We have seen this in other countries like uh, Portugal, where we, we did a lear learning visit, that recycled water can actually be used for watering, say, parks or being used for firefighting. Uh, in Eastern and Southern Africa, it is not something that is not yet considered, but this is now being looked at. Can utilities now think about solutions or approaches that use recycled water or water reclamation? Um, this would also help to conserve the water uh, so that it can be reused within the environment for other purposes, so long as it is treated to a, a usable level. Then the other aspect that we are working on is interagency collaboration. So the regulators among themselves the environmental regulator, which tends to look at the resources themselves. How well are the, the, the effluent discharge into the environment from the treatment plants? So that is the work of the environment regulator. Then we have the services regulator that looks at the supply of the water as well as um, sanitation services. Then there's the resource regulator who looks at where the water is abstracted from, the rivers, the dams, the boreholes, and so on. So bringing these three regulators together in an interagency collaboration helps to put together strategies that are working to ensure that services, the water is well used, there is efficiency of use, 
but as well as protecting the water from pollutants. So ensuring that what utilities are discharging, what industries are discharging and so on, is protecting the water bodies and ensuring that when water is obstructed for treatment, it is not so heavily contaminated that it affects the, the business of service provision. So this is very key uh, in issues of resilience that these three agencies work together. Then something that we have started working on as SOS is what we're calling a service resilience and emergency preparedness tool. So we're just about to, to launch this um, um, consultancy to develop uh, this tool. So when we say resilience, as uh, the question that Basti was asking and the definition given by Robert, we are talking about people, infrastructure, operations and systems, the ability of these to recover from shocks and stresses. And we are looking beyond climate. We are looking at shocks and stresses that involve economic issues, economic downturn, the pandemics, as was highlighted, um, the experience of COVID-19 taught us that we need to be ready as a sector as well to be able to absorb such shocks. And also we are looking at just general uh, sector issues like dilapidated infrastructure and so on. So having a holistic approach, which considers the policies and the legal frameworks for this, um, the social considerations, what are the vulnerability risks to the communities, to the general populace, and what would be an acceptable level that the community can, can absorb uh, in case of a shock or a stress. Also degradation in, of the environment and its effects on uh, people and ecosystems, how that is dealt with for resilience purposes. Of course, there's techno technical aspects as well, which looks at the infrastructure itself and the technology. How well can the infrastructure absorb uh, certain things? The digital technologies that are in place, the financial considerations, how do we put in um, finance and investment planning to be able to support resilience considerations? And at the bottom of all this is the human resource, the skills and the capacity that need to be developed to ensure that the sector can still continue to provide services uh, in whatever circumstance. So we are looking at levels of action that can be taken by utilities, can be taken by the regulators, can be taken by policymakers. In case of a particular shock or stress, what then is the action that can be taken? that we have utilities that are prepared for floods, that are prepared for droughts, that are prepared for um, infrastructure that is degrading and so on and so on. So this is the approach that we are taking within the SAWAS and among the regulators. Thank you so much, Robert. Thank you very much, Yvonne, for a very interesting and, and um, challenging presentation. Um, and uh, yes, I, I assume if you're going to be expanding as you have been doing, You'll soon have to change the name of your association, right? It will have to become the, the All African Association of uh, Water and Sanitation Regulators. Um, but um, yeah, let's see. Well, first of all, I, I would like to ask you two questions because you, you gave these six areas of work that you highlighted these particularities of. Uh, but I wanted to ask you particularly on the issue of recycling and reuse, which is a very common issue in um, many peri-urban areas, particularly in Africa. Um, and um, many of these reuse activities when it comes to reuse of water in agriculture are informal uh, phenomena uh, where people, you know, collect the wastewater that comes out of domestic wastewater coming out of cities and use them for small scale um, irrigation. And I was wondering, how do you think you could manage to get that under a regulatory framework, those, those informal activities? Is there a way to do that? Thank you, Robert. That's a very tough question. I know. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a big issue in many cities, particularly where you have the sewerage um, systems, the, the, the networked um, mm -hmm. sewer systems, because the communities deliberately puncture the sewer lines in order to access the wastewater and, like you have said, irrigate for agriculture. So 
it's for that one, it's a matter of ensuring that there are sufficient sanctions um, within the law for such um, activities that people learn that if you do this, it is actually not condoned. You're putting the lives of uh, other human beings at risk. And this is the consequence of action. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately for people, we only learn when there's an example. So utilities need to set examples of uh, punitive measures that can be taken uh, in order for people to desist from some of these activities. So it is really quite a, a big problem. Yeah, thanks. I, I know it's a tough question. Um, I, was, I was thinking of the way in Kenya at one point, the regulator sort of worked on getting informal uh, water distributors you know, uh, people that uh, water sellers that go along the houses to sell water, which is also an informal sector, to get those under the regulatory framework quite successfully and applying some of the uh, human rights principles. And maybe that's something that can be done in uh, water reuse also. Um, let's see if with Isabella whether there's any questions um, on the question and answer bit. Yes, Robert, we received a question. So Yvonne, how would you recommend addressing the conflicting regulatory agencies versus local government approaches to management uh, to managing water resources in a given area? I'm not sure if I've understood the question, but I will attempt to answer. Um, in most countries, what the regulators have done is they have actively engaged um, the local authorities especially for purposes of sanitation, because this was um, an area that was managed by municipalities. And in order to have an organized sector, there's been recognition that um, local authorities and regulators and ministries need to work together. So there are now joint implementation teams which have been put in place that address more than sanitation. They look at rural water, they look at urban um, water to ensure that regulators, utilities, uh, policymakers are coming to the same table and discussing solutions that are appropriate and applicable for their respective cities. This is helping to harmonize approaches. It's helping to um, steer coordination for management of the sector so that this conflict um, of management between local authorities and, and regulators. Sometimes the local authority thinks it has a regulatory mandate. At the same time, it has a service provision mandate. So trying to now harmonize that through dialogue and sector coordination, that these issues are ironed out, uh, whether it's at the policy level or illegal instruments or bylaws, to ensure that the mandates are clear and there's a clarity of who does what uh, within the sector and there's better coordination and harmonization. Okay, I see no more open questions there. Um, but the last question actually triggered, I, I had another question, Yvonne, if you don't mind, which is also specific to one of the elements in your presentation, and that is the issue of water source protection, which was the first block that you talked about. Um, and I think it's great that, that there's an effort to... Um, uh, have an initiative that that looks at water security um, of the uh, let's say the water catchment that serves Lusaka for its drinking water. Um, so, but my question is, if you're going to have people in these catchments to have to abide by certain rules and regulations that you will regulate um, about maintaining proper protection of the water source. Um, isn't it then right that you should also at the same time extend your regulatory activities to the drinking water quality in those rural areas? Because uh, to a large extent, drinking water regulation has remained for many reasons uh, ref uh, confined to urban environments. Um, but now you're going to ask these, re these rural people to look after the water source, but they'll say, well, we're happy to do that. But why aren't you also then checking on our drinking water quality? And so is this something that is being addressed by the regulator in Zambia and by the regulators in Africa in general? Yes, very important uh, point there. 
So a number of regulators and utilities actually have now taken over the mandate for rural water supply and sanitation. So one of the first things that the regulators are doing is looking at the quality of service standards for rural as well. And uh, being at a minimal level of regulation, um, the first point of entry is the water quality. So defining what water quality standards should exist for rural, for boreholes, whether it's small pipe systems and so on, there are minimum standards that are being defined for rural water and also for monitoring. So how to take the, the samples, when to the frequency of, of sampling, the frequency of yeah testing um, the water, all that is being defined by the regulators. So this is very important and tied to what you're saying, ensuring that catchments are protected. Of course, these are not just catchments in rural areas. Like I said, even in urban areas, um, catchment protection is also uh, being done. So the... Interagency collaboration is really focused on water quality and ensuring that uh, drinking water quality is, is maintained. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much for these explanations and for your presentation. And now we move on to the third presentation, which is by uh, Vera Ero, who is um, working for ERSAR, the Portuguese regulator. Um, Vera um, has a background in uh, public law and um, she has a postgraduate degree in environment and planning from Coimbra University. Um, and she's also a professor in public law at the Nova School of Law and, and the executive pres uh, president of the board of the ERSAR, as I said. Um, so welcome, Vera. I know you were in another um, Green Week activity this morning um, because I saw Katrina Fonseca's message on that. Um, but Vera is now with us. And so um, in her practice and research, she has focused on regulation, on public procurement, administrative law, energy law, environmental law, and planning law. And she has also published various articles and books on this topic. Um, so... Um, she was uh, working as a lawyer um, at a company before coming to the um, ERSAR. Um, and um, she has worked also as an advisor to the Portuguese Constitutional Court. I have a lot more written up here, Vera, but I'm not going to read it all. This is a long story. But anyway, um, here's Vera, and she will um, give us the second case study of this, uh, of this webinar on the um, role of ERSAR um, in strengthening resilience in water and sanitation. Vera, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Robert. Uh, can you please remind me of how much time do I have? You have 15 minutes, but okay. we tend to be flexible. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, um, as, as Robert was saying, and um, I, came, I came here to present the... the uh, our case, ERSAR's case, but uh, in, a, in a very detailed way, I am going to focus on a particular region of Portugal to see like uh, from a case study, what have we been doing in a particular region of Portugal where we have been suffering from drought. So what, what has been the, the regulatory agent's role here and uh, and the resilience topics that we we face here in, in Portugal but before I, I start with my presentation uh, and um, I don't know if if I'm allowed to do that Robert but I would pick up on on two things that Yvonne and and Batsi Rai and Batsi was were speaking about around resilience because this may be this may be helpful also we oh. have uh, okay so the the Portuguese uh, regulatory agency ERSAR we have we have developed KPIs, um, and they are they are drafted in Portuguese, but they are translated in English, and I can share that in the in our chat. Uh, KPIs uh, that measure the quality of service, and that and we have developed recently a new KPI on resilience. Uh, so how to how to measure resilience in utilities. Um, and so this this may may be uh, helpful for for what uh, Batsi was was explaining a little bit before, uh, in order for uh, regulators and utilities to be sharing the same vocabulary 
Uh, so this may be a, a, an indicator that may be helpful for for our um, participants here in in our in our uh, workshop. That's that would be my my first. Uh, uh, topic uh, around what Batsy was saying, and also uh, around what Yvonne was saying. And now I would I would uh, um, ask for the slide. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm the one uh, sharing. Okay, um, uh, around what Yvonne was saying that uh, we uh, the Portuguese regulator uh, we do mostly economic regulation. Uh, but we also do uh, environmental regulation in what regards drinking water uh, purposes. Uh, this, this is a bridge between economic regulation and environmental regulation. And so and, and this has been very helpful uh, in the, the way that we are managing some water crisis here in Portugal. So I would pick up a, a little bit of this also during my presentation, but I wanted just to make this bridge around uh, what uh, Batsi and, and Yvonne have, uh, have already referred. Uh, that was very helpful and many thanks for your presentations. So coming up with, uh, with our case, well, I will be focusing in a particular region of Portugal. Because um, Portugal is a is a wonderful country. Everybody should visit Portugal. But uh, um, what is very uh, uh, critical in what regards water management in Portugal is that the, the the country is divided. So we have a north region that is uh, that that is water rich. Uh, so we don't have any uh, difficulties uh, for now. Uh, of course, uh, climate change uh, uh, says that uh, in uh, in the near future there may be difficulties in the whole country. Uh, but uh, um, we have the north of the the country currently. Uh, very well in what concerns uh, water sources, uh, but then we have a very difficult uh, region in the south of, of Portugal, the Algarve region, which is a beautiful region, highly touristical region, where we have water scarcity. So for a back background purposes, I'm just I'm just showing here uh, a few data around what is happening in in uh, in the Algarve. So we have nine to ten years in a row with rainfall under average, and this is the, 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 the data regarding rainfall that is shown here. Uh, and the next slide, please. Uh, and okay, so and this is and this is uh, the, um, the picture of Portugal, the map of Portugal, where it's shown the different regions and the fact that there is water scarcity in the south of Portugal in the Algarve region. So uh, this is from the from the last year, but it hasn't changed uh, in uh, in uh, in uh, 2024. So we have in November we had uh, like this a uh, uh, huge alarm around uh, uh, scarcity in Portugal in the Algarve region. So if you can see the the north of Portugal is is okay, but then you have this this region in the Algarve. Uh, can you next slide, please? Um, this has meant, and just uh, uh, an additional data, uh, this, this has meant that we have, we, we have in the Algarve, in what regards the superficial water, uh, we have uh, less than 50% of the reservoirs uh, uh, filled. Uh, and uh, th this, this means that we have less water than, than what we, we used to have uh, last year. Uh, and, uh, and actually, um, this, this, mean, this means that we haven't had in the past years uh, recovery uh, regarding the, the, the superficial waters that we should have had in order to be comfortable in what regards the use of water in this region. Next slide, please. So this is this is the baseline for the regional topic, the, the Algarve, just to, 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 to setting up the scenario. And now I will set up the scenario around the institutional framework and the and their size intervention. So um, we are a regulatory agency that has uh, uh, powers over a national national mainland. Uh, we regulate all utilities for urban water and waste services, regardless of their governance model. So if they are state owned, municipal, municipal owned or privately owned. Uh, and we do a behavioral regulation, structural regulation and a bit of environmental regulation in what regards drinking water purposes. 
So we have a, a very diverse uh, um, set of utilities that we regulate, uh, uh, a total amount of 353 utilities that are regulated between water, wastewater and uh, waste management, 10 million consumers and, uh, and the size and the diversity of the regulated uh, operators and utilities is very vast. So we have uh, state-owned uh, companies, municipalities, local entities, and and so on, and so on. And also, uh, from a technical perspective, we we also have the country kind of divided into two speeds. We have utilities that are very modern. Usually, they they are operating in urban areas. They have high technical expertise, and they they have a a, a, a strong amount of know-how. So they are like first speed uh, utilities. And then we have very, very small utilities, poor utilities, usually locally owned, locally managed, that uh, do not have enough uh, know-how nor technical expertise in order to face the challenges. So we have kind of a, a divided country also in what regards the, the, the technicalities around utilities. Next slide, please. What do we do? So uh, we are a regulatory agency, and and this also um, makes a, a bridge with what uh, with what uh, Yvonne was was referring as to the regulatory powers that we have, uh, and uh, we we set uh, a part of the tariffs is set by us, but usually in the water sector, the tariff setting is a responsibility of the the, the utilities. They are the ones that that uh, uh, set out the tariffs. We do, we provide uh, opinions, so we need to. They need to hear air SAR on their uh, uh, tariffs, um, and if they don't comply with that, what their SAR is saying in our uh, opinions, they need to justify why they are not uh, uh, complying. Um, and um, the regulatory principles that we base our our uh, activity on are are. Uh, five regulatory principles, cost recovery, sustainable use of water resources, the protection of cons customers' interests, affordability and stability and predictability of the, the decisions that we made. And this is something that we set out in a tariff recommendation that is uh, um, approved by the, the AirSARS board uh, and that is uh, uh, public publicized in, the, in our website. Next slide, please. So we have set out the scenario um, in what regards the Algarve region. So Algarve region has uh, more or less uh, 500,000 uh, residents, but uh, uh, more than 1 million uh, tourism uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the region. Um, and um, in uh, November, December, um, the the scenario that was put forward was that uh, during the summer, we would have very, very high difficulties in providing water for all the people that were living and visiting uh, Portugal as a, a tourism. Um, so the, the, there was a, a need to reduce water consumption. Um, and I think that uh, uh, picking up on what uh, Vatsi was saying on the meaning of resilience, what do you mean by resilience? Uh, resilience um, needs to be considered in in two different in two different ways. First of all, how to have contingency measures applied very fast in order to uh, uh, to uh, um, to reduce water consumption very fast uh, and to uh, uh, maintain uh, maintain uh, um, maintain you know, living standards in the region, and then uh, in the medium long term, uh, what can we do to uh, increase the resilience of infrastructures and the the, the fact that uh, in the medium long term there will be less water available or uh, uh, too much water or too too little water. Uh, so in this particular case, I will focus on the the interim measure, the, the 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 restriction measures that needed to be applied very very quickly in order to have uh, water reserves uh, during the summer. Uh, so 
there was a need to reduce water consumption and uh, to implement awareness campaigns. So what and what was the role of the economic regulator in on this regard? And this is a photo that was taken in uh, January in the Algarves. If you can see, it's raining. Uh, but uh, the the garden is still being being um, um, watered, um, and there was heavy res water restrictions already implemented in the Algarve. So uh, uh, this means that some things needed to change very very quickly. And this is just to to show evidence of what was happening because uh, this is a true photo. I can tell you. So. What needed to, to, to actually happen? Stakeholder engagement and governments uh, to promote efficiency because uh, there would be no, no new, and we would need to, to find very quickly new water sources. So this is a, an example of, of the, the, the awareness campaigns that were, that were uh, put in place uh, already in January. Can you please uh, move forward with the, with the slides? Uh, and then we need to make uh, stakeholder engagement. And then this is where things get very difficult because as I referred, we have uh, many municipalities, many different utilities, very different in size. And then we have many sectors that use the water and water is not managed by one single entity. So you have entities managing water for agriculture purposes and industry, and then you have entities that manage water for urban purposes. So the stakeholder engagement here is very, very difficult in the water sector. Another slide, please. So this, the economic uh, uh, regulatory uh, decision that, that we took um, uh, was to recommend to the municipalities in the Algarve an increase in the tariffs. Tariffs in the, uh, in the Algarve are already 20% lower than the medium tariff in, in Portugal. And what the regulatory agency, what the ESAR uh, put forward was that in order to induce behavior so that people would start uh, actually decreasing their demand for water, it would be necessary to have a small increase in the water tariff so that, uh, um, so that everybody would be aware that there is a need to reduce cons uh, consumption. Uh, another slide, please. Um, and... Uh, it, it, of course, there were there were um, there was a decision that was made by the government in order to uh, set out uh, uh, restrictions and and uh, um, uh, and reductions in the in the in the in the consumption of water. And in what regards the tariff setting, the the, the drought committee that was put in place. Uh, followed the ERSAR's uh, recommendation, and there would be an increase in the tariff setting 15% to a 50% increase. Um, another, another slide, please. But, and, and picking up on, on something that Yvonne said, uh, the, the tariff setting here uh, is, uh, is a, a resilient uh, uh, model. So we have uh, the, the economic regulation, the management of water scarcity did not leave behind the principles around tariff setting. So there is a first block of, of uh, human consumption that goes up to five cubic meters that uh, with the main objective of access to basic needs that would not be increased. And then the second block of the, of the, the tariff that, is, that has an additional cost from five to 15 cubic meters would be increased by 15%. And then the third block uh, that, that means consumptions that are uh, uh, over 15 uh, to 23 uh, cubic meters would actually have the, 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 main, the main increase of 50%. And there would also continue to be implemented the social tariff, the family tariffs, and uh, this, would, this would be an increase around the seasonal uh, only a seasonal tariff increase so that we would be able to face the drought. Um, another another uh, slide, please. So what uh, ERSAR as a regulatory agency was uh, putting forward was that there would be a need in the Algarve to have seasonal tariffs in order to encourage efficient consumption when water is less available and only during that period. Um, so uh, this means that in a short term, you would have measures to induce uh, a, a, um, 
uh, lower consumptions, but at the same time, you would need to plan for additional capacity for new origins of water. Next slide, please. And so this was done at the same time. And at the same time, there would be measures implemented on a medium long term connected with the reduction of water losses in the urban sector, uh, with the, 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 the promotion of use of reclaimed water that was already referred here also. So there are a, a set of, of works and investments that are currently being carried out. Uh, so that they they uh, uh, actually answer the difficulties that we have from a medium long term perspective, but on a short term perspective, there is indeed a need to decrease the consumption of water in the Algarve region. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. um, and this is something that that um, uh, also stems out from our from our work as a regulatory agency. So. Uh, a part of our work uh, is also uh, applying KPIs and measuring uh, the, how the KPIs are being uh, um, are being uh, uh, implemented by the utilities. Uh, we receive data from the utilities, we validate the data, and we assess performance by the utilities. And one of the KPIs that we assess on a, on a yearly basis is the water losses KPI. And so we know very well Algarve region and what are the water losses in the Algarve region. And so we know as a regulatory agency that the water losses in the Algarve region are approximately 15 million of cubic meters. Uh, and this, is, uh, this has meant that there is a clear solution also to increase water availability by reducing uh, water losses in the, in the Algarve uh, region. And this is a self-paid investment. Next slide, please. Also, reclaimed water. Uh, we only have seven utilities that produce reclaimed water, and we have very, very low uh, volume of reclaimed water in, in Portugal. In the Algarve region, there are approximately 40 uh, million of cubic meters of reclaimed water that could be used. And this is also that uh, this is also something that steams out of, of uh, AirSAS KPIs and that has been used as a reference for short, medium term solutions for new origins. Next slide, please. So what happened with the tariff setting, you can ask? Well, we made the recommendation. The municipalities seem to be in agreement uh, with, uh, with our recommendation, but that agreement only lasted for two days. Okay, so and this is a lesson learned, and I think that this is this is uh, something that should be uh, should be uh, considered by by all countries. Which is, it, there is a very very strong difficulty in local authorities to manage difficult decisions, even in critical times. So there was a need to increase tariffs. There was a technical a consensus around that. Um, there, there, there was actually a consensus uh, by the municipalities on day one, but on day three, uh, for political reasons, uh, two or three municipalities decided not to increase tariff setting, and then the prisoner's dilemma just came through and nobody, uh, well, actually only two municipalities raised the tariffs, and, 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 and that was a loss opportunity here to implement a very strong uh, principle around regulation. So political interference that overrides the adequate approach in many cases. So it's important to create buy-in from policymakers and to support them in keeping the right track. Um, aggregations, size, scale are crucial to ensure common oversight in situ in crisis situations. Mira, information. Can you, can you round up? Yes, and yeah. and actually, yes. This this is my last slide. Okay. Uh, so I think that that we can we can keep the 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 rest for for the discussion because this is my this is my last slide. So, um, I hope that this is useful, and I'm totally available for questions. Thank you so much, Robert. Okay, thank you very much, Vera, for a very comprehensive overview of a particular part of Portugal that unfortunately I've never visited, but I've always wanted to. But I understand that. There's about uh, triple the population in the summer when the tourists come than the normal residency of uh, the Algarve area. So that's quite an impact. Um, and, and that was actually one of my questions because I was wondering as a, a regulator, apart from 
you know, having this idea of seasonal changes in the tariffs, would you have um, have the jurisdiction to actually charge those people that come to the Algarve, who obviously already spend a lot of money to have their holidays there, could you actually make sure that they also get charged extra as tourists for the drinking water they use in order to sort of, you know, keep tariffs um, affordable for the local residents, or is that beyond the, um, you know, the jurisdiction of the of the regulator? Uh, that is beyond that is beyond our jurisdiction, um, and uh, and uh, but to be honest, from from a tariff setting point of view, um, the tariffs are set for uh, uh, domestic purposes. So uh, we set out the tariffs for domestic purposes uh, in order to. Uh, actually protect consumers from from prices from too too high prices and also from too low prices but but the tariff setting here is for domestic purposes so mm -hmm. uh, the, the 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 tariffs that are set out for commercial purposes um are higher than the ones that are set out for domestic purposes so that's that's the the difference this these blocks that we have are blocks that are considered for domestic purposes only and not for commercial and industrial uh, uh, consumption. Okay, and commercial, including hotels, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. okay. Okay, so the other question I had was also to do with the tourists because I, I as I said, I've never been to Algarve, but I understand many tourists come there to play golf and golf courses are a, a, a notorious uh, uh, absorber of lots of water. Now, um, in that sense, do you in your and do you have any opportunity in your regulatory framework to also promote the uh, water fit for purpose concept? Because you can imagine, especially if there's such a um, you know potential for using wastewater mm -hmm. uh, or recycled water or whatever you want to call it, then that would seem to be uh, an issue where you would probably want to uh, suggest to golf courses to use. Uh, mm -hmm. to reuse water rather than to use uh, fresh water. Maybe they do so already, but I was just curious whether you have any influence on that with your regulatory powers. Um, we have a, an indirect influence on that. So um, the the fit for use water uh, topic is something that is uh, being uh, uh, considered and put in place in the Algarve. So for go for for instance for in what you in your example for golf uh, purposes they can only use uh, reused water now for okay. for 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 watering the 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 courts um and what uh, but this is not our jurisdiction what we what we set out is the need to have a tariff for waste management. Mm -hmm. uh, for water waste uh, uh, management solutions that or wastewater that's the, yeah. the 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 word in English wastewater solutions that um, is not putting up the costs of putting the water fit for purposes for golf reasoning for instance in the the the, um, the consumers but instead in the users of that water in the golf ports, okay? Mm -hmm. So this mm -hmm. is this is where we put our, our foot on the door. We are saying that everything that's connected with um, actually putting uh, uh, wastewater fit for purpose, uh, other than, of course, uh, uh, agricultural reasons, for agricultural reasons or for uh, tourism reasons, for instance, those activities, those additional treatments or those additional words that need to be made in order to to take the 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 wastewater from one place to the other, this is something that needs to be charged to the user of the wastewater and not to the consumer in our households where we use mm. the water and then we we have the service of the the wastewater management. I'm not sure if I'm I'm being clear no, no, about yeah. that. Other, another topic that where we where, where we intervene is considering, for instance, a new origin, the production of water through desalination. Mm -hmm. What we are referring is that OPEX and CAPEX that is it's needed for desalination purposes. If desalination is being used in order to actually free 
um, uh, superficial water for other purposes than drinking water, then this means that it should not be the consumer to pay desalination costs. Mm -hmm. So this needs to be spread around all, all yeah. sectors because all uh, in, indirectly, all sectors are being uh, actually favored by desalination and not mm -hmm. just the, the urban consumption because uh, uh, this is a, a water management topic. Yeah. So this is this is where we 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 are. We we look okay. mainly to consumers mm -hmm. to urban urban consumption and drinking water, but. I think that, and this is a, a message that uh, that uh, I think it, it's showing everywhere that uh, we have only one water, uh, and yeah. so all users need to be connected, and uh, and that is why indirectly we have a say in other in other topics. Yeah, no, absolutely. We have one water, and all those waters we have captured them in the SDG six. It's not only drinking water and sanitation. Um, we're still struggling with getting our heads around integrating all that into one big picture. And I saw that the agriculture people, uh, as usual, are resisting that they have to have cuts because your recommendation was 75%, 50% uh, cut from 75 to 25, but they, they didn't really accept that. They were the only group that resisted um, the changes that were proposed by the group that you presented, I saw. Yeah. Anyway... Um, Betsy, do um, no, Betsy, not Isabella. Do we have any um, questions for Vera before we move on to the general discussion? Hi, Robert. We do have one. Okay. So, Vera, how do Portugal uh, water regulator effectively uh, encourage the widespread adoption of reclaimed water systems and foster community acceptance of using treated wastewater? considering potential concerns and misconceptions? Um, okay, so I think that um, the first step that we took as regulator uh, is connected with, uh, with the KPIs and uh, with data around uh, uh, wastewater and around the, the existence of wastewater and uh, and so this is this is something that uh, that we have been working for many years now. Uh, and uh, and uh, as this is technical information, validated data, this is something that has supported now the, the policy of, of using more wastewater, recycled water for other uses. We don't we don't advocate here in Portugal the use of recycled water for drinking purposes. Um, fortunately, the, we, we, we for now uh, at least there is no need to do so. Uh, but there, there is uh, uh, a very strong opportunity to use recycled water for uh, agriculture, for tourism, uh, for even waste management, and for public uses uh, around the cities. Um, this is something that is being uh, explored. We have made a recommendation around tariff setting. Um, so that uh, it is very clear what is being paid by the consumer in the, the wastewater services and what needs to be paid by the user of the wastewater, uh, 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 of the recycled water in, in, in its activity. And also in what regards the implementation of the measures, uh, for instance, in the Algarve region, we... Uh, put forward all the data around around the, the existence of recycled water. And so this is something that is being used kind of a solution for a restriction. So uh, there is a restrictive measures um, uh, preventing uh, some uses of the water that is uh, that is the, 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 the tap water. So you cannot use the, the tap water for gardening uh, uh, golf courses or for gardening your, your own gardens, mm -hmm. but you can use recycled water. Okay. So this is something that has been put forward kind of, uh, you cannot, but you may have this alternative. And, and this, this meant an increase of demand, of course, of the, of the recycled water. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, we we uh, here in Portugal we have not had uh, uh, that uh, amount of public discussion or public um, uh, debate. It's not a, a matter of debate, but it's it's being accepted accepted. Uh -huh. 
Um, it's not Other used for drinking yeah. purposes and it's being accepted as a new origin of water. Um, mm. So this is something that has been uh, 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 that has been actually um, in the in the public eyes for for uh, uh, some years now, mm -hmm. and uh, and it has been accepted as a new source of water, as a okay. sustainable source of yeah. water, as circular economy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much, Vera, for this and for your whole presentation. Uh, it was very useful and and informative. Um, so I think now we move on with the three speakers as panelists to see whether there are any further questions in the audience or some of the questions that we had brought up earlier in our group um, that we can bring up for discussion by all the panelists. Um, Isabella, uh, are there any generic questions in the Q&A that we can bring up for the uh, panel? Hi, Robert. Yes, we have. Uh, the first question is, as a regulatory entity, what measures are planned to encourage the efficient use of water? The which use of water? The efficient, efficient. Use, use of water. Uh -huh. Sorry, I didn't hear well. Uh, I had a cut. Can you please repeat the, the question, Isabel? Yes, I'm so sorry. Uh, that's okay. So as a regulatory entity, what measures are planned to encourage the efficient use of water? Okay. Is this something Yvonne or Vera from their practical perspective would want to address or Betsy from a more generic sort of global perspective? I can jump in um, yes, from, yeah, general from the regulatory side as Vera already indicated with the tariff design that she showed how um, the different uh, blocks um, address different aspects of uh, operations. But beyond the tariff, utilities also themselves are learning, uh, some of them the hard way, on efficient use of water because in some of our settings, utilities are expected to provide 24 hours water supply. Mm -hmm. And what tends to happen is in the night when there's little use, then uh, you get the pipe burst because there's too much water in the system. You have pressure and you end up with um, water losses instead. So now they regulate um, how much water is available um, during certain times. Right now in Zambia, for example, there's a drought. So already the utility is rationing water to try and uh, only provide water during certain hours. That also helps customers to think about efficient water use. Because if you don't have water available the whole day, you think about storing water and using what is available much more efficiently. So it also takes some work on the side of utilities to do some behavior change and uh, working with the regulator as well to um, do some advocacy and mm -hmm. some uh, consumer awareness. Any of the two others want to add to that? Um, sure. We have a different experience. Um, uh, our goal here in Portugal is that people uh, remain with, with water in their pipes 24 hours per day. Uh, and, uh, and so the challenge here is how can we, how can we maintain this level of service uh, and at the same time uh, raise awareness that this level of service is something that needs to be valued it's something that needs to be uh, considered uh, 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 with respect uh, mm -hmm. so that it's not it's not put away just because it is there so the and uh, the 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 first message that we that we uh, put forward as regulators is uh, around the data that we have that shows that uh, there is a relevant amount of water that is being treated in our systems and that is lost uh, mm -hmm. in the way. And so the first message that we that we put forward from and we make uh, economic studies around carbon footprints also and around uh, the costs that is connected that are connected with the, the production of this and the, the treatment of this water that is that is uh, um, that is not used. Um, and whenever there is uh, um, new investment in new origins like desalination, for instance, 
we as regulators say, okay, desalination is a, is a possible solution, but please be aware that the first solution that needs to be implemented is efficiency mm -hmm. and reduction of water losses. For mm -hmm. instance, in the Algarve region, water losses are 15 cubic meters. Desalination will mean 16 cubic meters to be of water production. And so the, 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 the slide that I showed with the measures that are being implemented shows that a, a reduction of water losses is certainly a top priority uh, now. And, uh, and, and efficiency is a solution that is available. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. and so this is something that we we put forward as regulators with all the, the economic calculations around what would be the results if we would uh, take be more efficient mm -hmm. in in the in the water management. Thank you very much, uh, Vera. We're almost getting to the end. I was I'm looking at the questions and I see one question from Mohammed here. Uh, very nice to have you with us, Mohammed. Um, and he's asking, are there any possible possible measures one can refer to in a war situation? Now, resilience and war are two sort of uh, almost two extremes, two other sides of a, of the coin. Um, and, and it sounds to me when I listen to wars as they are going on in the world now and wars as they have been going on in the past, um, that, that a war's purpose is really to break the resilience of the opponent, right? So once you have broken that resilience, you've won the war. Um, and the best resilience you can have is the prevention of war. So if you have diplomatic, um, if you have diplomatic efforts to prevent war, that's probably the ultimate resilience before a war starts. Um, so I think there's not much we can say about that. Um, but resilience against natural forces that we can, with some level of um, certainty, we can predict, um, and, and that is an issue that we didn't come to, but the predictive the, the capacity and the instruments to predict certain at the basis of, of developing resilience um, is another area that we need to address in another um, future webinar, I guess. Um, so let's see whether at the end um, there are any final words any of you would like to say. Uh, just a quick one minute go. Uh, Betsy, Vera and Yvonne uh, at the end of this discussion on resilience. Um, that's first. Thank you, Robert, and thank you, Yvonne and Vera, and to all the participants. I think one of the main things that kept resonating um, as both Yvonne and Vera were speaking was around this issue of consumer engagement, because it's easy to think about what utilities or regulators need to do, but I think also the consumers need to be aware of the actions that are being taken and how they can contribute to those and what part they have to play. So I think some of the questions that were raised in the chat around, um, for instance, Vera, how did you get buy-in in, in terms of some of the resilience measures that you put in and you also highlighted the engagement that was part of that, I think is something that I'm really um, taking forward um, in, in, in these discussions and really worth exploring deeper as to how such engagement can be deepened for other aspects of regulatory work and not just resilience. Okay, thank you, Bansi. And uh, Yvonne, you have any last minute wisdoms you want to share with us? I think the only thing I can say is that um, it takes collaborative efforts. It's coordination of the sector. So as Batsy had started uh, with that presentation, it's really uh, a, a coordination of the sector to move forward together. Thank you. And Vera? Uh, well, just a, a short word on, on governance and uh, the need to, to actually have the stakeholders all identified and all working together. Uh, water management uh, is uh, is an instrument of peace, actually. Um, so uh, I would say peace in the communities, and uh, and so I would I would just put forward this 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 message. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for that, and that brings us to the end. Um, I I want to thank all the three speakers for their participation and their contributions. Um, I want to thank Isabella for uh, for uh, supporting the whole event. Um, and there's something I would like to say at the very end. Um, people can ask, well, is resilience really worth investing in? And of course, uh, we're now we're in Europe in, in an EU Green Week uh, event. We see the uh, floodings that are happening in, in Germany. 
Um, and um, I was thinking back because in 2005 in the Netherlands, there was a similar event where there was a lot of melting snow and rainfall. And there was an area of 250,000 people who all were evacuated from that area because there was a great risk of flooding. Um, and after that event, the government in the Netherlands decided to give more space to water and they built all sorts of infrastructure that would allow water to flow out into those spaces if there was a sudden surge in the rivers. Um, and at the beginning of this year, we had such a surge and it turned out that those uh, nature-based solutions, as it were, if if uh, that they that now that they've been implemented, actually were effective in taking away this, the the risk of having floods in areas where a lot of damage and a lot of both material and human life damage could be done. And so we see that resilience, investing in resilience, does pay off. Um, and the uh, situation in Germany is a stark reminder of how we have to invest in resilience to prevent events like that from happening. So on that note, I would like to conclude. Thank you to IWA and to the EU for uh, organizing this. Um, and I wish you all a very good rest of the day and uh, see you at the next event. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Robert.